From time immemorial, humanity has yearned for peace. Peace that does not mean just absence of war. Peace that signifies sublime harmony. Men at peace with themselves and nations at peace with their neighbors. It is only when peace prevails at home and abroad that tradition can be preserved and enriched. For centuries, the Indian mind has not only cherished peace, but also explored it in its many dimensions. Ritual chants of the Vedic Aryans invoked peace, peace on earth, peace in the heavens, in the vast infinite stretches of space, peace in the realms of animal and plant life, and peace in the innermost recesses of our minds. If there is a central concept that has dominated Indian thought and the civilizational ethos of the country, it is peace. Ancient Indian philosophers were aware of the fact that fruits of peace are for all to share and delight in. When peace reigns, pursuit of prosperity is facilitated and the spirit soars. Countless rains have long since washed away the stains of blood that once disfigured the earth here. This is where Ashoka, the great Mauryan emperor, experienced a dramatic change of heart after witnessing the scenes of carnage on the battlefield. The victor was filled with revulsion and remorse. The events date back more than two centuries before the birth of Christ, but the moving words continue to reverberate and inspire humanity. Ashoka's stirring call for peace found an enthusiastic response everywhere, because mankind has always protested against the cruelty of war and the wanton suffering it brings in its wake. The contest between good and evil has been waged continuously despite the efforts by men of vision to snatch a respite. More than 1500 years after Ashoka, another great son of India followed in his steps to deliver a unique message of peace. Akbar, the greatest Mughal emperor, made a heroic effort to implement an ambitious blueprint for peace. The concept of Sulai Kul endeavored to establish a lasting basis for communal harmony and to end military strife. Akbar's ideas continue to provide inspiration to lovers of peace in India and abroad. Alas, the words of caution have not always succeeded in stemming the tide of violence. It is not as if sensitive souls have not protested against or resisted the rising tide of violence. Throughout the medieval period, the Sufi saints and mystic poets raised their powerful voice, pleading for love, compassion and harmony cornerstones on which the edifice of peace must rest. The march of scientific progress has unfortunately brought with it weapons of mass destruction. Technological developments of armed soldiers, rendering them capable of inflicting untold misery on innocent civilians. Violence on an unprecedented scale has been the leitmotif of the first half of the 20th century. As war clouds gathered on the distant horizon, turmoil within the land was brought into sharper focus. For years, the Indians had been struggling to throw off the colonial yoke. The advent of Gandhi, like a gust of fresh air, had revived the masses. Gandhi was soon to be identified as a messianic figure. He galvanized Indians by convincing them that power of peace is greater than the might of most awesome weapons. Finally, the British had to bow out. The legacy of Gandhi continues to be a living presence, guiding mankind like a beacon of light. Gandhi is recognized, with Buddha and Christ, as an apostle of peace. Gandhi's most significant contribution was to relate peace to everyday life of the common man. 
Jawaharlal Nehru was sojourning in Kumal Hills when he received the news of Hitler's march in Austria. The rude shock ended the reverie. Surrounded by quiet and peace and well-being, Nehru basking in the mellow sun had been contemplating the folly of unceasing strife. Was it worthwhile to go back and waste one's life efforts in dealing with them? But confronted with catastrophe, he realized that there was no escape. The passions of the world have to be endured and the anguish shared. If the majestic mountains are to remain untouched by human folly, with gentle wind rustling through the pines and birds to continue singing joyously, then we have to be ever vigilant in preserving peace. It was Jawaharlal Nehru who was most eloquent and effective during this phase. He reminded us that when eyes are bloodshot, the vision is limited, and that fear is an ignoble emotion that leads us to strife. He reiterated that in times of war, civilizational process stops. Mankind must somehow pull itself back from the brink. It takes 20 years or more of peace to make a man, but it takes less than 20 seconds of war to destroy him. Just two years before India attained independence, mankind was shocked by the advent of nuclear weapons that seemed to threaten the human race with extinction. Philosophers like Bertrand Russell were constrained to ask, has man a future? Advocacy of peace became even more urgent and imperative. It was Nehru who suggested, before anyone else, a standstill agreement in 1954 to suspend nuclear testing and move towards disarmament. The Indian stand has ever since been unequivocal. We stand for peace and global disarmament. Peace is indivisible and can only be enduring when it is based on a just and equitable world order. Discriminations and disparities can only subvert peace. To safeguard peace, Nehru fashioned the policy of non-alignment. And to keep India outside the conflict, to combat militarization, and to slowly but steadily extend the area of peace, India pioneered non-alignment, which won enthusiastic adherence, and soon the idea became a powerful movement. Uh, there is this whole uh, history of India having struggled for decolonization uh, against uh, apartheid, against racism, uh, establishment of a new world order based on fair play. Uh, and if you see Pandit Nehru's uh, speech at the Asian Relations Conference, again there this broad view has come out very clearly. He has very clearly said that simply um, uh, disarmament is not going to uh, solve the problem and we have to go beyond and uh, eliminate these structures of uh, inequality and asymmetry that have been uh, put in place or built up uh, during the uh, colonial period. Nehru was acutely aware that there could be no economic development in a world riven by tensions and torn by conflict. Only a policy of peace could protect the hard-won independence of the Afro-Asian nations. In the immediate aftermath of Indian independence, colonialism and neo-colonialism cast a dangerous shadow over the future of the newly independent nations. Apartheid in South Africa was an unacceptable blot and a continuous humiliation of the proud indigenous people. Imperialism and racism constantly threatened the fragile structure of peace. Pursuit of peace has gone hand in hand with the pursuit of a just social order at home. Peace does not mean the mere absence of war. It means a ceaseless striving for universal justice, a world in which every human being can maximize his or her potential without hurting others. Peace also means cooperation and collaboration with friends and neighbors, near and distant. India has entered many meaningful partnerships to fortify the bulwark of peace. 
but commitment to peace has not protected india from wanton aggression these wars have taught us to secure national interest and preserve peace by remaining vigilant and building up self reliance a passion for peace does not mean not caring for one's own security only that peace is durable which is based on strength strength which has no aggressive intentions but just because uh, you you say you are committed to peace doesn't mean that you will not take appropriate measures to maintain your territorial integrity your unity there is growing awareness of the dividends of peace a quarter century of peace has made it possible for millions in india to emerge out of shadows and to assert their rights and claim their rightful place under the sun countless underprivileged have been enabled to enjoy the fruits of peace hundreds of millions today have access to better nutrition better health and access to education tribal communities residing in remote corners of the country have gently been brought into the national mainstream those condemned to live in servitude and bondage before independence have broken the shackles that fettered them No one today is prepared to accept an existence that is deprived and degrading. Peace has meant restoration of national pride and dignity for the individual. Years of peace have witnessed a steady march of progress. The women, the tribal and the minorities have been empowered through a series of revolutionary legislation. The signs of progress greet us everywhere. India as a nation of nearly 1 billion people is self sufficient in production of food grains. The country is the largest producer of tea and milk. It is the second largest producer of rice and the third largest producer of wheat, cotton and tobacco. The green revolution has transformed the landscape in the countryside. Industrial development has kept pace with breakthroughs in agriculture and giant strides have been taken in the production of steel and cement. India has the largest railway network in Asia and the second largest in the world. It is difficult to imagine that without peace the impressive temples of New India the towering dams and the gleaming steel plants would have ever come up the nation's achievements at the frontiers of science space nuclear energy and biotechnology have dazzled the world india's passion for peace has touched others too be it the celebrated prisoner of conscience nelson mandela in south africa or the dauntless champion of civil rights for the non-whites in the USA the late Martin Luther King Jr they have all drawn strength from the gandhian ideals india and indians have always been in the forefront of this battle for peace however we must never forget that only a peace between equals can last where there is no brotherhood and equality there peace cannot prevail not for too long the fact still is that there are predatory states 
in our neighborhood. There are predatory interests that can, in a sense, undermine India's sovereignty, India's national interests. And this has been the case. It will be the case even in an ideal situation where there is an imbalance of power, where there's a differential in power. So when that happens, there are always states that are going to, uh, shall we say, further their interests at the expense of other states. Then in that situation, what are you going to do by way of protecting and safeguarding your interests, except build up the wherewithal to prevent it from happening, from, and to have the wherewithal to deter those who would encroach on your territory, encroach on your interests. Today, India is a nuclear weapon state. This is a reality that cannot be denied. After concluding the series of tests on May 13, India immediately announced the voluntary moratorium on further underground ground nuclear tests. Naturally, India reserved the right to review that decision if in its judgment extraordinary events take place that jeopardize India's supreme national interest. The CTBT also gives the same right to every country. India becoming a nuclear weapon state is consistent with its policy of peace. We do not intend to use these weapons for aggression or for mounting threats against any country. These are weapons of self-defense to ensure that India is not subject to nuclear threats or coercion, not intended to start an arms race. If India needed nuclear weapons for power, status and prestige, and India we should have gone nuclear a long time ago, perhaps in the 50s itself. We could have easily done it. Technologically, it was possible. And I don't see politically why it should not, not, not have been done. If the logic was power and prestige, I think successive generations and over the decades, Indians, Indian governments have felt strongly that we don't need nuclear weapons for power and prestige. Our prestige, our power, our status will be governed by many other things. How we solve our problems, how we solve poverty, how we stand up to our principles how we conduct ourselves. The only political utility the nuclear weapon has is as an ins instrument of influence, pressure, coercion. The only defense against nuclear weapons or nuclear coercion is to have nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, there is no other way to defend yourself. This is the land of Mahatma Gandhi and Lord Buddha and others. Uh, what did Gandhi have to say? He maintained that if you wish to remove poverty, if you wish to remove inequity, then you must have the power to make the change. One sixth of mankind cannot be denied its legitimate place in the comity of nations. Our nuclear policy has always been marked with restraint and openness. Indians have never violated any international agreement. The restraint exercised for 24 years after having demonstrated our nuclear capability in 1974, is itself a unique example of restraint. Restraint, however, has to arise from strength. It cannot be based on indecision and doubt. Neither national security nor world peace can be safeguarded by the weak and the vulnerable. Our strength and capability adds to our sense of responsibility. We wage this struggle for finding peace and security through disarmament for well over two to three decades. And each effort we made, we suffered a setback. And uh, ultimately, even then, we kept our option open and didn't exercise it, We're still hoping against hope that sometimes there would be a real security uh, in the context of the whole world disarming itself uh, uh, from the nuclear angle. But only when it didn't happen and the threat became, uh, became a reality on the ground, uh, we were left with no alternative to act in self-defense and take the measure. As a nation, India is committed to the principles of the UN Charter and promoting regional peace and stability. Our policies shall continue to reflect an unflinching commitment to sensibilities and obligations of an ancient civilization, a sense of responsibility and restraint. Efforts for closer engagements with our neighbors will be strengthened 
our dialogues with other key partners will be intensified, covering the entire range of issues which require collective considerations. The policies of economic liberalization introduced in recent years have increased India's regional and global linkages, and the need today is to deepen and strengthen these ties. In the 50th year of our independence, we stand at a defining moment in our history. The major thrust of our foreign policy remains economic, or should remain economic, in terms of our finding markets, in opening up our market, in seeing that the benefits of uh, what is known as globalization or liberalization. As a civilization that has traditionally been outward looking and as an independent, non-aligned country with a long demonstrated commitment to multilateralism, India remains confident that a strong and stable India will be seen as a responsible and engaged member of the international community as the world moves towards meeting the challenges of the 21st century. India has always been at the forefront over the last 50 years of the nuclear narrative, or maybe 53 years from Hiroshima till now. But the commitment to principle was not realized. For instance, you could say that disarmament has been a complete red herring for the last 53 years from Hiroshima to now. India has made pleas that have fallen on deaf ears. But it's only now, after India has carried out its tests in May 1998, that you find that there is a greater sense, there is a little more, shall we say, attention being paid to this whole question of disarmament. But this is not to argue that India carried out these tests so that the, the purposes of disarmament may be served. I think that is to put the cart before the horse. Because India's commitment to disarmament is valid. And I think it is perennial. And my own feeling is that it will remain abiding till the last nuclear weapon is put away. The revolutionary Indian mystic and internationalist Sri Aurobindo talked of a religion of humanity, a religion that would permanently abolish war, cruelty of all kinds, and the degradation of any human being, eliminating the oppression and exploitation of man by man. The spread of this new faith cannot be achieved by treaties and covenants. It is only the passion for peace in the minds of men that can rid the planet of the scourge of war.